Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Vivian Valberg, president of the club and correspondent for the Daily Oklahoman. I want to welcome all those National Press Club members and guests who are in our audience today and also those listening to this luncheon live over the more than 260 stations of the National Public Radio Network. In addition, this luncheon will be carried on a delayed basis by the more than 1,100 cable television stations affiliated with C-SPAN, the Cable Satellite Public Affairs Network. If you have questions for our speaker, and I hope that you will, please write them on the cards which are at your table and send them up to me. I'll ask as many as time permits. You should know that our speaker next Monday will be Senator Robert Dole, Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. And on Thursday, our speaker will be Alan Newharth, Chairman and President of the Gannett Company, which has just introduced a new national newspaper. Now for the introduction of our distinguished head table guests. If you will withhold your applause until I've finished introducing them all, and if they would stand as I call their names, the Washington Bureau Chief of the Scripps League Newspapers who organized today's luncheon, Lee Roderick, the United States Deputy Chief of Protocol, Thomas Nassif, the Minister of Trade of the Philippines, His Excellency Roberto Ungpin, National Editor of Hearst Newspapers, Joseph Kingsbury Smith, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, the Honorable John Holdridge, the Ambassador of the Philippines, His Excellency Benjamin T. Romualdez, Publisher of the Washington Times, Jim Whalen, the Minister of Information of the Philippines, His Excellency Gregoria Sendanya, United Press International Diplomatic Correspondent, Jim Anderson, United States Senator from Hawaii, the Honorable Daniel K. Inoue. Prime Minister of the Philippines, His Excellency Cesar Verata. From Crane Communications, the Chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee, Stanley Cohen. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, His Excellency Carlos Rom Romulo. <laughs> Romulo, I'm sorry. <laughs> The Associated Press Diplomatic Correspondent, George Guetta. The Minister of Defense of the Philippines, His Ex Excellency Juan Ponce Enrile. American Ambassador to the Philippines, the Honorable Michael Armacost. President of the National Press Club of the Philippines, Ben Rodriguez. Assistant General Counsel, International Affairs of the Treasury Department, Russell Monk, and the Chicago Tribune Diplomatic Correspondent, John McLean. Thank you. Our speaker today is the President of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos. It has been 16 years since President Marcos came to the United States on an official visit and 16 years since we first welcomed him to our podium at the National Press Club. When he appeared before us then, he had just been elected president of the former American colony, which became an independent nation in 1946. We knew Marcos was a war hero. He got so many medals in World War II that when the young Major Marcos met four-star General Omar Bradley, the general saluted him. We also knew he was a persuasive fellow. How else could he have managed to get his wife, who is known to be strong and bright, to marry him after they'd known each other for only 11 days? And we knew he was experienced in overcoming political adver adversity. After all, the first case Mr. Marcos ever won as a lawyer was when he successfully defended himself from prison against a charge of murdering a political opponent of his father. The president of the press club at that time, Wynne Booth, remarked at the great warmth of the greeting Mr. Marcos received in 1966 
and said, and I quote, your very presence reminds us that you and your great people are the faithful allies of our country in time of trouble. And that, sir, is something the American people and the men and women assembled in this room are not about to forget, end quote. But much has happened in those 16 years. In the interim, Mr. Marcos declared martial law, or what he called constitutional authoritarianism, and did not lift it for 11 years. There have been charges of corruption, abuses of human rights, and political repression, and recently the Archbishop of Manila called openly for him to resign. But through it all, Mr. Marcos has remained president, and this week, President Reagan warmly welcomed him, stressing the many common ties between the two countries. The New York Times recently said, quote, in a country that is deeply sensitive to style, Ferdinand Marcos has it, and it has allowed him to take the sweeping actions that in essence converted the nation from an ill-functioning, raucous but free democracy into his personal fief and seemingly personal permanent possession, end quote. President Marcos comes to us today as the head of a nation with a long friendship with the United States, a nation considered crucial to America's defense strategies in Asia. We are eager to hear what Mr. Marcos has to say. It's my pleasure to present to you Ferdinand Marcos, President of the Philippines. Well, thank you very much, so Madam President, distinguished uh, guests, uh, my uh, friends. It certainly is gratifying that in the course of my present visit to uh, the United States, I should once again be accorded the opportunity to meet with the people who understand me or misunderstand me most. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you. I uh, remember that um, our relationship, um, the relationship between the two countries can uh, be uh, opened up uh, at one of two points by the historian or the curious uh, investigator into world events. One, the uh, military, which was Admiral, or then Commodore Dewey, sinking the uh, Spanish fleet under Montojo on May 1st, 1898, in Manila Bay. And with the help of um, the Filipino revolutionaries under General or President uh, Emilio Guinaldo, who then proclaimed the first Philippine Republic. Incidentally, uh, President Emilio Guinaldo was the grandfather of Prime Minister Cesar Virata, who is here. Um, my grandfather only commanded the revolutionary forces. We have changed uh, places since then. <laughs> um, Either that point of entry is chosen, or the more sedate commercial one, a hundred years back. 1796, the brig Astria, sailing out of Salem, Massachusetts, towards Lisbon, and then to Manila, selling your wares there for five, her wares there for five months, carrying that uh, amateur and self-taught mathematician and navigator Nathaniel Blowditz, whom you must have heard, who later in 1806 authored the Practical American Navigator, for he had discovered the simple way of determining longitude through the long voyage across the Pacific. The American government bought the rights of the two editions, and it has become a standard text for all those who study salesmanship from King's Point to uh, Annapolis. Either way, 
It has been dramatic and historic, and it was always to be so. There was always extreme on both sides, enmity, if not enmity, extreme friendship, a relationship of love, hate, and this is my fate and destiny. I thank you all for this privilege and this honor. It may be said that an official journal like mine ought always to visit with this press association for, as someone once observed correctly, the American press is, of course, the fourth branch of government in this country. And then also it is well to remember that the so-called so solicitude with which Americans regard developments in the Philippines is perhaps now where more pronounced than in the devoted reportage by the American press on our country. This scheme of the American interest of the American press notwithstanding, there is, I fear, some confusion in this country of what is happening in the Philippines today. It has been one of the shocks I encountered while preparing for my present journey, and also upon arrival here in Washington, to read in the one of your outstanding papers, a statement to the effect that the Philippines is still under military rule, which it is not, and that there is no civil government. Such misstatements, uh, whether intended or otherwise, conveniently merge with more accurate reporting about the true situation in the country, resulting in much confusion and misimpressions about our country require clarification. So perhaps I should begin by st stating first a few basic facts about our country without uh, too much embroidery. The Philippines is a Republican state with a duly elected government at national and community level. We have a constitu national constitution duly drafted by a constitutional convention elected and convened in 1970 and duly ratified by our people in 1973. Under that constitution, ours is a modified form of presidential government with a um, national assembly constituted by assemblymen elected by regions in 1978 and a president directly elected, directly elected by the people in 1981. Legislative power is vested in that national assembly while the executive power is vested in the president. And the uh, party in power, the party that won the most number of members in this National Assembly, chose the uh, leader of the legislator, legislature. And the leader is the prime minister, and he's no other than prime minister, Cesar Virata. We have an independent judiciary which is under the full supervision of the Supreme Court. While it is claimed that uh, uh, human rights are not protected by uh, the courts or that uh, civil rights uh, are not uh, duly enhanced uh, by the Constitution uh, because uh, there is no way of seeking, say, the remedy of uh, a uh, writ of habeas corpus. The truth of the matter is Anyone, anyone can petition for a writ of habeas corpus in the, the Philippines. In fact, all those who have been apprehended as having brought in hundreds and hundreds of firearms bought from the PLO and other sources and who have bragged openly in the television when they are caught that they were the leaders of these rebel groups uh, and who later changed their tone on the advice of their lawyers. Uh, went to the Supreme Court and uh, were able to obtain an order from the Supreme Court for the Philippine government to bring the bodies of these people to the, before the Supreme Court, which we did. There is not a single man who has filed a petition for a, a writ of habeas corpus who has not been able to compel the government to bring the uh, body of all those petitioners to the Supreme Court. In fact, the Supreme Court ordered an investigation on the allegations of torture, and the results were negative. 
The doctors testified that they examined all of these persons, all these petitioners, uh, during the period of confinement, and they never complained about any um, mistreatment uh, or torture. And some indiscreet remark indicated that this was merely said on the advice of the lawyer as a preparation for defense in the criminal trial. Now let's review overall the um, overall uh, measures. Uh, all measures that have been issued by the president uh, were issued at his instance alone? No. They are issued at, uh, after a meeting of what is known as the party caucus. You who have studied, who have studied constitutional law uh, know that uh, in a modified parliamentary or presidential form of government, the um, president actually doesn't make the decisions. He may uh, lead the party and therefore in the caucus he may exert influence in the caucus, but the caucus decides what is going to happen, what is the policy to be adopted. In fact, our constitution institutionalizes uh, this uh, procedure and states that uh, the program and policy of government shall be adopted by the cabinet, submitted to the president for approval, but shall be responsible to the members of the National Assembly or the Batasam Pambansa, and for which the Prime Minister must stand. If he is rejected, then he must quit, he must resign, and a new Prime Minister must be appointed. Now, over all cases uh, are appealable to uh, the Supreme Court, including cases um, of security against the state. We have a system of local government and administration throughout the country. In all, there are 73 provinces, 60 cities, 1,502 municipalities, 42,000 um, barangays, in each of which there are regular elections. Barangays are the villages. We just had elections this year. The election for president occurred in 1981. Under the Constitution, the people have a right of recall. They can recall anyone who has been elected by one-fifth of all the voters who voted in the last election. A vote of one-fifth will suffice to call a new election for any given post. Our Constitution likewise provides for a Bill of Rights which guarantees protection of the political and civil rights of all individuals regardless of color or creed. Incidentally, uh, that statement allegedly made by Cardinal Sin has been denied by Cardinal Sin. I was surprised that you haven't heard about it. Uh, uh, th this just goes to prove that uh, there is some time lag uh, when you move towards the West. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, Cardinal Sin, when he arrived in the Philippines, uh, um, appeared before some of our uh, friends and uh, said, look, there is no quarrel between the church and state, and the church and state are separate. I have no intention of intervening in political affairs. I have not stated that the president should resign. That's his business. That's the business of the people. He was elected by the people, and I'm not about to say anything about this. That's why I'm surprised that here you make much uh, of it, but I suppose that's part of news. It's good copy. Can you imagine asking the president to resign? That's, uh, by uh, constitutional mandate, social justice is a matter of national policy and a priority objective of government. And this is why one of the first reforms was land reform. You know, when I proclaimed martial law, I didn't proclaim martial law alone. Uh, it, I didn't proclaim martial law alone. Uh, it is made to appear as if uh, I, I just uh, signed a decree and said, I impose martial law on each and every one of you. No. I ask the legislature to please pass a law proclaiming martial law because there was anarchy in the country. Now, uh, let me uh, say this. The opposition was strong. And... Uh, they were members of the Security Council and somehow they had adopted the resolution which uh, required that there be a unanimous vote for the armed forces to be able to move 
and therefore the armed forces was immobilized. At the same time, I asked uh, um, the um, opposition party to come and join me in a coalition government. I offered one half of the cabinet. And of course, they laughed at me and said, why should we join you? We're going to take over the government. By the time you are through with the exercise, you're dead, politically and otherwise. <laughs> so, and they uh, refused to join uh, me. I asked the advice of the uh, judiciary. I asked the Supreme Court justices, the Court of Appeals justices, and the members of the private sector. And all of them told me there's only one man who can proclaim martial law, and that is the president. And you are it. You are the only one who can proclaim martial law. This is why I must carry this particular mark in our history. I could have I could not have transferred it to the legislature. Why? Because the legislature did not have the power. What does the Constitution provide? The uh, President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and he may order the Armed Forces out to quell any disorder, riot, rebellion, invasion, insurrection, and in case of invasion, insurrection, rebellion, or imminent danger thereof, when the public safety requires it, he may suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus or proclaim martial law throughout the Philippines or any part thereof. What does that provision provide? It provides that only the president can proclaim martial law. I repeat, that is why I had to assume a responsibility. And I am not one for shirking duty. The people said there was necessity for proclaiming martial law. And the people said, you are the only the official who can proclaim martial law. So I, hey, I proclaimed martial law. And I sincerely believed that it was necessary to proclaim martial law to install order and stability because there was complete anarchy throughout the country at the time. Now, therefore, uh, at that particular period, well, what was the status of our government? Our government was immobilized, impotent. The armed forces could not move out. The industry was uh, not at all in any way uh, um, moving. Uh, there was no income coming into government. Everybody was running away. They burned the U.S. Embassy, partly burned the U.S. Embassy, tried to burn it anyway. They tried to kidnap the American ambassador. American ambassador was Byrod, Ambassador Byrod. And uh, they tried to kidnap uh, our foreign minister, Foreign Minister Romulo, whom you just uh, um, saw today. And I told him, you better disappear because I will not ransom you. Uh, <laughs> But whatever it is, they burned the Manila International Airport, they bombed the Supreme Court, they bombed the Constitutional Convention, they bombed the City Hall, they burned uh, part of uh, Malacanian Palace, they attempted to uh, kidnap my children, they attempted to kill the President eight times. There was, of course, an attempted assassination against the First Lady. You all know about that. And uh, th this uh, uh, required that I immediately uh, act on it, and uh, so uh, I uh, did. Now, um, we established uh, land reform. We were fighting a group known as the Hukbalahap, Hukbung Nagpapalaya Nambayan. It was socialist inclined. It was leftist. But uh, they were friends of mine because we had fought in the, uh, in the Second World War together. And uh, so I approached them and I said, look, I'm going to establish land reform. If you are fighting for land reform against the feudalistic agrarian uh, system, then you must join me. And they did. I want to introduce to you the leader of that rebellion, who is now present and is a part of the government, Mr. Luis Tarouk. He is a member of the National Assembly. The one, one reason why he ran to the hills, according to him, was he was elected as a member of the old legislature and he was not recognized as such. He and the others. Now I want to introduce to you another uh, leader of the Free Farmers Federation 
which is uh, also composed of farmers who wanted reform, but uh, who are fighting for reform, but who are now joining in the effort to establish political stability and economic prosperity throughout the country, and who was dean of the College of Law of the University of Ateneo, but abandoned his deanship in order that he may join in the effort to attain the uh, noble mission of this new society. I refer to uh, National Assemblyman Jerry Montemayor. <laughs> President, <laughs> President of the Federation of Free Farmers of the Philippines. I would like to introduce also to you a young man who uh, was very active against the government in 1972 and uh, who paraded around the streets raising the flag of, of the Communist Party and organized the Kabataan Makabayan, which is the red organization of the youth. And this man is uh, Nilo Tayag. Is uh, he here? Anyway, he is uh, somewhere around here. But they have all joined. All these activists to prove to you that all these stories about uh, our being oppressive uh, against uh, our enemies and our friends, they've all joined the government uh, to help uh, reform and uh, drive out all the corrupt people in the government. We have an ombudsman. We are the only country with an ombudsman. You know what an ombudsman is. He's the officer who watches over the uh, uh, corrupt officials of government. And uh, uh, this man has charged 1,000, about 1,000, more than 1,000 officers and employees and sent uh, most of them to jail. Uh, is Justice Pamaran here? He must be somewhere around. Uh, where's Justice Pamaran? There he is. There is the ombudsman. And we have, we have not uh, deprived anybody of private property. On the contrary, while we are a free enterprise society, we have an egalitarian base, we recognize private property, encourage private initiative. And our constitution explicitly recognizes the importance of developing the national economy and protecting the patrimony of the nation. In line with this, a National Economic and Development Authority has been created for the purpose of planning and coordinating economic development plans. I chair that uh, Economic Devel um, Development uh, Commission. Now, I did not come all the way here to recite these basic facts to you, but it is best that uh, we wrote this at once. For or, um, They form an important background of understanding the developments in my country. Relations between the United States and the Philippines now span, oh, I'd say 84 years, if you mark the Battle of Manila Bay, 184 years perhaps, if you mark the, the um, Brig Salem, uh, from Salem, which when it returned to Manila, Salem brought back, uh, what, hides, indigo, lumber, pepper, and paid 24,000 in tariff duties. Many things don't change, not even tariff duties. <laughs> and, <laughs> the trade between our countries uh, is covered by a trade agreement. The military and security matters are covered by three agreements. Those agreements are, and I will now ask our uh, friends in my staff to distribute these agreements to you or as many as can uh, receive them. These agreements are the Mutual Defense Pact, the Military Assistance Agreement, and uh, the um, uh, Military Facilities Agreement, which is due for review uh, this uh, coming year. President Reagan and I have uh, agreed with the members of uh, our cabinet that uh, the review will start in April, probably will finish it by August. Through it all, our relationships develop in a way unique to nations so disparate in size and circumstances and so distant from each other. The direction which American colonization took in the Philippines in the political, economic, and military cultural spheres were such that for us, 
relations with the United States would remain crucial for a while. It is said that language is the greatest conveyor of culture. If that be so, if that wise man who said that is right, then your language has certainly conveyed to my country your culture. And this is why the relationship between our country is something undefined. Our interests may have diverged in the period after our recovery of national independence in 1946, but this relationship has endured. And the question that is often asked is, does the Republic of the Philippines differ from the American Republic? Yes and no. It doesn't differ in the sense that it is democratic, but it differs in the sense that we have a prime minister and in the sense that uh, we uh, try and uh, make the legislature and uh, the um, uh, president or the executive work together. We cannot afford any stalemates. We cannot afford any delays. It is a modified presidential form of government while yours is a complete and pure presidential form of government. Why did we change this? Because we cannot afford stalemates and deadlocks. Yours is a strong economy and a military power. Ours is a weak country. It cannot afford to delay and postpone decisions pending the uh, debates between Congress and the President or the Prime Minister. The poorer third world countries cannot. And so, my friends, that is the situation. I am now going to ask also that my staff distribute to you the social and economic indicators of my country in showing to you the dynamism and the vitality of our economy. We have changed uh, our economy such that we hope to be able to be self-sufficient. We were importing rice before. The last time we imported rice was in 1976-77. We paid $500 million for that price. Today, we are exporting rice to our neighboring countries. And uh, the uh, per capita income was about $200. Now it is more than $800 uh, per, uh, per capita income. The um, gross national income has increased five times. I need not go any further. I'll wait for the questions. And now I am ready for interrogation. Thank you, Mr. President. Please give us details on your meeting with President Reagan. Did you seek any firm commitments? Did you get them? Well, a firm commitment as to uh, when we are going to uh, re review the basis, yes. A firm commitment that a mechanism be set for the study of uh, our economic problems, uh, yes. Because, as you know, the reason we have a deficit in our balance of payments is. Uh, the commodity prices went down because of your uh, domestic deflationary policies, your interest rates. But all of this can be worked out. Uh, and so it has been agreed. So Secretary Reagan of the Treasury is going to meet with our foreign minister, who is also prime minister, regularly. The next meeting is uh, uh, next uh, November, I think. So uh, we have worked that out. The national... Uh, uh, security matters will be worked out by uh, the defense minister. The two defense ministers are also meeting in the November. Those are the specific ones. We have also entered into a tax agreement uh, and um, air agreement. This afternoon, tomorrow, there will be some kind of a, a, uh, agricultural agreement. As you know, uh, we have one of the most modern and biggest concentration of agricultural and natural scientists in Asia. This is in Los Banos, the University of the Philippines. And um, we have biogenetics, we have uh, plant uh, engineering, we have uh, name it. You remember that the International Rice and Research Institute is based there and that it was the one that produced um, the new uh, type of rice which produced the rice green revolution and we help your scientists produce the uh, corn that uh, can fight mildew when your scientists could not produce it we did 
that uh, center is uh, going to be developed. We are also hoping to be able to exchange uh, technology on uh, uh, non-conventional energy and other uh, uh, matters. It has been reported that your government will seek $2 billion in rent from the U.S. for the Philippine bases. Is this an accurate report? No, it is not. We have never talked about figures. Louder and clearer. We can understand the question. Uh, the question uh, was, is it correct that we have demanded $2, million, two billion in the rent? The answer is no. We, we haven't quoted any ex uh, figure. What we have asked is this. We want a study. What is it that is necessary in order that we can perform our job? You and I know that if the Philippines is attacked, the United States is not necessarily bound to immediately react because the provision of the Mutual Defense Pact is that you will immediately take steps as is necessary to meet the contingency in accordance with your constitutional processes. What does that mean? That means that you go to the Senate and the House of Representatives. What does that mean? That means delay while we are dying there. <laughs> Most of our allies in Europe, concerned about resisting communism, give the U.S. free bases and even share the cost. Why shouldn't we expect the same kind of cooperation from the Philippines instead of demands for more rent? Well, uh, for one thing, um, you haven't exactly uh, paid for what we lost in the last war. If we must make an accounting. 75% of our cities were devastated in the last war. We lost a million men. Shall I quote you the statements of Roosevelt and MacArthur that every carabao will be paid for? Shall I tell you that the veterans who were inducted into the USAF, the United States Armed Forces of the Philippines, of the Far East, your armed forces were paid only one half the salary of your soldiers? Shall I tell you that uh, we almost turned communists because you refused to recognize us. Shall I tell you that uh, I had a difficult time stopping my guerrillas, 25,000 of them from joining the communists, because precisely you, you, you uh, sort of forgot that uh, we had done the fighting for you, you know, and uh, we were parts of your armed forces. But in fairness to the American Congress, when we came here and we called attention to the fact that we had been abandoned and forgotten, they themselves in outrage immediately passed the law, recognizing the services of the uh, Filipino and reinstating them as parts of the United States Armed Forces in the Far East, including back pay and benefits. That, uh, uh, Madam President is uh, the answer, in addition to the fact that uh, those people that you are talking about have uh, been making money at the expense of the United States for quite a long time, while we have not. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, U.S. bases in the Philippines could not be defended. Why should we expect that in another war these bases would be more reliable? That's one of the questions that I wanted to find out. <laughs> Is it true President Reagan has not raised with you any concern about repression and human rights? Well, he uh, sort of uh, spoke of uh, the uh, fact that uh, we have all this constitutional provision. But we uh, did uh, speak of the fact that we must maintain and enhance human rights in uh, general. But this uh, fault finding that we found in some of these uh, reports before uh, uh, isn't there. There is this open-mindedness and fairness which we expected of America and the Americans. 
the Americans that I know, the Americans who fought beside me, the Americans who bled with me in many a battlefield was a fair man. He was a just man. He was a courageous man. He was a man who saw right and did right. And it is not fair to accuse the Philippines of any violation of human rights when there has been no violation. Though if there has been any violation, we punish those who have violated. And I now ask that uh, this pamphlet, particular writing of one of the most celebrated figures who is, claims to have, who in the, at the beginning of the campaign against my government, claims to have been uh, uh, maltreated by uh, some of the military men, now uh, reports exactly what happened. I asked that my staff distribute the letter of Herrera, Trinidad Herrera. You have, <laughs> you have indicated that the allegations about political repression and human rights are overblown. How then do you explain the findings of the international independent group Amnesty International, which documented cases of torture, disappearances, and illegal detention? Well, I'll tell you that the Amnesty International has never come to the Philippines. <laughs> uh, that's why all they talk about is something that they obtained hearsay. Let's uh, give one specific example. Father Abedicio, a famous case. Father Abedicio is supposed to have disappeared. He is a member of the clergy in the Philippines. He's a Filipino. He disappeared and we couldn't locate him. Not even my best intelligence officers could uh, locate him. And what did we discover after six months? We discovered he had run away with somebody who claimed to be a nun, and he was in Germany. <laughs> How do you like that? And we got blamed for it. <laughs> oh, we got blamed for it. That's it. That's how the Amnesty International has been reporting all this thing. This questioner says, I have been in Manila and talked with both Filipino and U.S. businessmen. They say the Philippines are the most corrupt nation in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and that your wife's nickname is Miss Ten Percent. Will you comment? They must mistake us for another nation. He must have uh, been uh, uh, in, uh, living in the bar. Uh, because I can tell you, there is this uh, man, uh, Justice Pamaran, whom I just introduced to you. He is the uh, ombudsman. You who know what an ombudsman is, knows exactly what he can do. He doesn't wait for evidence. Any rumor whatsoever, and he investigates it. Uh, you talk about uh, my uh, uh, wife. Uh, not that uh, I would like to defend her. She can defend herself any uh, time. Uh, she's quite uh, capable. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, that statement was said of uh, another first lady, not my wife. Not cer certainly not uh, my uh, wife. Um, perhaps I can tell you that uh, uh, the uh, property of the Marcuses has been uh, um, brought into a blind trust. And not a 2020 blind trust either. It's a real blind trust. Uh, and we don't know exactly how that blind trust operates the property. The only property that we have control of are two, house, two or three houses. Uh, one in the province of my Locos Norte. No, two. Two in the province of Leyte and one in Manila, five. Then the schooling for the children up to uh, possibly a doctorate. Uh, beyond that, all income goes into the Marcos uh, uh, Foundation, which is uh, the foundation that embraces all uh, property. Uh, do you think that if there was any corruption by the Marcos family that we can maintain the present prestige and leadership of uh, the Marcoses in the Philippines? What do you think the Filipinos are? They are a very literate people. Literacy in the Philippines has increased up to 90% nationwide, and in Manila it is 100% uh, uh, um, literacy. And if there was any indication whatsoever of any of this uh, corruption that uh, you talk about, and uh, you, uh, uh, whoever said that uh, sounds uh, 
like he has been in uh, the wrong company. Probably, probably the guys that he was working with uh, may have been engaged in corruption. I'd like to know who they are. Uh, <laughs> then we'll go after them. But I can assure you, if any public official engages in corruption, he will land in jail. That is definite. What do you say to critics who say your health is poor and you won't be around very long, but your wife may be? Anybody want to try me in the ring? <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. I, I refuse to answer questions like that. <laughs> Two related questions. You are indeed a family man. Your wife, your daughter, your brothers are all government officials. Do you think the next president of your country will be a Marcos, and would you like for your wife to succeed you as president? No. Uh, no. Uh, the, the problem uh, here, of course, is uh, that uh, one, you do not understand the Philippine politics. You see, first of all, my uh, um, my brother, did you say my brother was mm -hmm. governor? Government officials. My brother volunteered his services for Medicare. Uh, did you want him to withdraw his voluntary services as a medical <laughs> officer? He is serving our country practically free. He abandoned a very profitable medical service. Uh, uh, career in order to serve what we uh, have as Medicare, which is your uh, uh, Medicaid, no? Yes. Uh, he, he is not a government official by any means. It, this is a voluntary uh, organization. My uh, wife was elected. He was elected because the candidates uh, wanted uh, to include him, uh, to include her. They wanted somebody to carry them. Um, Minister Romulo will tell you that without uh, the support of uh, the governor, who happens to be well liked by uh, the people of Manila, they probably wouldn't have won in the last uh, elections. It's just a matter of uh, um, helping out uh, in the uh, political uh, campaign. My daughter, my daughter is uh, the uh, voluntary head of a group of village uh, um, leaders. That is not a political organization. That's not a government organization. This is an association of uh, young kids who are organized in order that they can help each other. Kabataan uh, Barangay. And uh, I, I am surprised that uh, you hold it against these young kids that they get together so they can play football, they can, play, they can encourage uh, sports, they can encourage uh, um, people, uh, the young kids, from going into drugs. Don't you think that you should also uh, organize something here in, the, in the, uh, the United States and get somebody to uh, oh, stop the young kids from going into drugs and instead go into sports? Well, that's what they're doing. Now, with respect to uh, the other uh, officials, um, uh, the uh, question, uh, of course, uh, doesn't specify. Let me uh, put it this way. As I told you, our government is a caucus government. Consensus. When the consensus of the party demanded that I appoint the uh, First Lady as a member of the Executive Committee, I had an agreement with them, and that is that he, she, would not become President or Prime Minister. At the beginning, even Prime Minister Cesar Verata was for the First Lady becoming Prime Minister. But the First Lady and I stood our ground and we nominated the Prime Minister Virata instead. Now, is that uh, the action of anybody who is uh, um, to preparing to take over a, as a dynasty? Now, my other daughter, well, she is in the Pennsylvania, she's studying voice culture, uh, and she is in uh, anthropology. I, I don't see what connection that has with politics. So. 
Mr. President, your opponents say this trip is costing between $5 million and $20 million. What is the budget for your trip? That's ridiculous. Uh, uh, my cabinet is spending uh, only uh, a very minuscule part of that. If there are any people who have joined uh, this group, they are on their own. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> they are on their own. Do you believe the United States now has a consistent, understandable policy toward the Philippines and East Asia? Shouldn't uh, you ask that of uh, the United States uh, leaders, not me? <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, yes, insofar as we can understand. What I, say, what I see is a resurgent American uh, nation under a new leadership, trying its very best, earnestly trying, to arrest decline and slide in prestige and in policy, in domestic and foreign policy. That is what we see from the outside. There is an earnest effort to prevent drift and confusion. Now, uh, we would like to encourage that because uh, among the small nations, uh, there's no possibility of any progress so long as there is instability throughout the world. And so, as I said uh, last night, what I see now, 16 years after my last visit, actually my last visit was when I came to uh, participate in the memorial services of uh, President Eisenhower in 1969 not 1966, 1969. And, um, but uh, what I see here is uh, while in the past uh, America was in the dark um, and there were doubts and misgivings, there were fears that you were, you were tiring, you were uh, weary, you doubted your own strength, you didn't know where you were going. But now, there is uh, hope, and uh, the phenomenon is what we see is an America emerging out of the shadows. It's still partly in the shadows, but uh, it's trying to emerge. And certainly, under the leadership of uh, President Reagan, it's trying to organize an integrated, understandable foreign policy. And that's what we see. There is widespread malnutrition in the Philippines and only one-third of your labor force has regular employment. Given this, how do you justify the prosperity in which you, your family, and friends live? <laughs> you must like us, the way you ask us questions. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know where you get your figures, but the unemployment problem... Uh, Unemployment figure in the Philippines is 4%. I don't know what's yours. <laughs> I do know what's yours. But uh, um, have you heard of the KKK? Not the Ku Klux Plan. Uh, but we have a program which uh, harnesses the energies of those who are half employed, like uh, those who are in the farm. You see, uh, those who await for the coconuts to fall or who plant rice are uh, partly employed. And so we allow them to uh, um, engage in the, what we call small, medium-scale industries, contract work. Where, in what country do you see, say, a boot block? A boot block. Go to a rural bank and say, look, I used to borrow money from this usurious uh, uh, lender here. I borrow five uh, pesos in the morning, I have to uh, pay him six pesos in the afternoon. Can't you lend me uh, 50 pesos uh, now and I will repay you uh, later on? I have no collateral, I am unknown. I don't, uh, I live in the streets. And in what country will you see the rural bank lend this boot black money? After looking at his shoe shine stand, and gathering all the other shoeshine boys 
and putting them to work and getting them to repay this indebtedness, not uh, in a week, but perhaps even in a day. Or fishermen, fishermen who live a hand-to-mouth existence. Even here, in your prosperous United States, can a poor fisherman go to a bank and borrow money on his name, on his signature? He cannot, but here in the Philippines, he can. A poor fisherman can go to the bank and say, look, I live in so-and-so, and the um, chairman of my village can certify that I am a poor fisherman. And I would like to organize a group. Can you lend us 5,000 so I can buy a motor, I can buy a net, I can buy a small uh, boat, and uh, we can improve our uh, earnings. And under our laws, we have set aside funds, which then are lent out. And we have been able to lend out about 1 billion, 200 million pesos under this scheme, and they have been repaid. They have been repaid, and that's the uh, worst part about it, isn't it? Uh, uh, many people don't believe it, but they have been repaid. And so we have a situation where the work ethic has been encouraged. We tell everybody, you don't plant rice, you don't eat rice, you don't work, you don't get anything. But you work, we'll give you the wherewithal, we'll give you the funds, we'll teach you how to work if necessary. And uh, we'll uh, uh, see to it that uh, we will uh, sell your uh, products. That's what's happening in the countryside. Not all this uh, talk about corruption and, and this... Uh, all these uh, ridiculous statements about uh, uh, people in government uh, enriching themselves. When you have activists like Luis Tarok and uh, um, Jerry Montemayor and Nilo Tayag and these men who were ready to kill the president, uh, but who now sees that the reforms that are being instituted are for the good and welfare of the country, you don't engage in any of this uh, uh, foolishness that you talk about. No, everybody is sincere and earnest about making our democracy work. And I can tell you, I can tell you that whoever um, has told you about uh, these uh, uh, unwholesome uh, uh, observations about the Philippines better come back to the Philippines. I'll pay for your trip. So you can uh, see what's actually happening. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I ask our final question, I want to present you with a certificate of appreciation for appearing once again at the National Press Club and with an updated version of the National Press Club necktie. Ah, ah. Thank you. Thank you. And now our last question. Is it really true, as your biography states, that you were born in a thunderstorm? <laughs> How should I know? <laughs> but my mother says so, yes. <laughs> my mother says so, and I guess, uh, if you can't believe your mother, whom will you believe? Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much.